Hey there, I'm Joe Weems. Before we get into the video, I want to remind you about NGConf 2023 happening in Salt Lake City, Utah on June 14th and 15th. Head over to ngconf.org to check out the speakers, check out the talks, and to get your ticket before they all sell out. We'll see you there. All right. So if you know me really well, you know that I'm like a big nerd about Magic Move and Keynote, and I love making these really cool slide decks that move between code. But we're all back in person, and I wanted to have some really cool slides for 2022. And the best slides have like nice illustrations, but I'm not an artist. What I am is an Angular developer. So here's what I'm thinking. For this entire slide deck, I've let random strangers on the internet using an Angular app that I've built illustrate my deck. And I'm excited to show you the results because it's spectacular. The best slide you're going to see at the entire conference. But first, let me introduce myself. My name's Mike Ryan. That's me. You can follow me at Twitter at MikeRyanDev. I'm a principal architect at LiveLoveApp, a GDE in Angular, and you probably know me as being one of the co-creators of NGRX. And I'm so excited you chose to join me here in Salt Lake City at the Grand America Hotel. So some of them aren't actually bad, some of them are going to be pretty good. Uh, here's what I'm thinking. OK, you know those like ML apps where you give it a little prompt and the machine learning algorithm spits out some art? I'm like, man, nothing's better than human creativity. I can build the same thing using Angular, but have real humans use my Angular app to illustrate these slides. So the first thing I had to do is find some humans to actually draw my artwork for me. So have you ever heard of Mechanical Turk? OK. It's an AWS service, and the idea is you have like a little bit of work you want to do, and you put it up via an API, and real humans all across the globe swarm to do that work for you. So what I'm thinking is I'm going to build this little Angular app, and I'm going to give the users a prompt, and when I give them a prompt, it's going to reach out to Mechanical Turk, find someone somewhere in the world to actually draw the artwork for my slide deck. To do this, the architecture is actually pretty straightforward. I'm going to build an Angular app, and it's going to connect to Firebase. I'm going to type in a prompt, and Firebase is going to send that prompt to Mechanical Turk. Mechanical Turk will find some real humans who are then going to launch my Angular app, draw these masterpieces, and then I'm going to save the masterpieces back up to Firebase. So this is what the app looks like. At the top, you get a prompt. Please draw a picture of state. I bet you're excited to see what people thought state looked like. I'm excited, too. On the left, they can choose the brush width. In the middle, they can pick any color that they want to draw with. On the right, they've got a save button. And in the middle, a beautiful canvas to draw their creations with. And of course, this is all built with Angular. <laughs> so I'm going to build this with an Angular, as an Angular app. And again, I'm going to connect it to Firebase. But the thing that I'm really excited to leverage for this is a brand new NGRX library called Component Store. <laughs> So if you've not heard of Component Store, it's a new state management library. But unlike NGRX Store, its older brother, NGRX Component Store is for managing local component state. You can use it completely independently from the rest of the NGRX ecosystem. If you've ever used a subject with a service, it's basically that, but super powered. So we're going to be using Component Store because I think what I'm building here is a highly interactive, though reusable, widget that I'm going to want to break up into smaller subcomponents. So let's take a look at the component tree for this Angular application. Well, I have my app, and what I want to do is I want to make this fully reusable. Like, I want to use this drawing board again later. So I'm going to call this reusable component the easel. And I'm going to divide this up into subcomponents for each responsibility of this easel component. So I'm going to have a prompt that actually shows the prompt to the user, a toolbar where they can change the brush width, the color, and the button. I'm going to break that toolbar up into the width selector component, a color selector component, and a save button. Finally, I'm going to have the canvas component itself where they actually draw. So this is going to be my component hierarchy. But you're like, OK, Mike, I hear you talking about this component store, but like, why would I use component store? We're well, going to want to use component store because it does three things really, really well. It helps you share state, manage the lifecycle of observables, and it's going to help us decouple logic from our components. So let's start with state. And you can tell this is state. <laughs> 
In fact, this is Florida, and we know it's Florida because they added Mickey Mouse and an alligator and some water, so it must be Florida. So this is the state of Florida, and this is an angular component over here. And let's talk about the angular component and not Florida. So let's say that I'm using the color selector, and I choose a new color. And this is a regular Angular app. So I need to get that color all the way up the component hierarchy and back down to the canvas using inputs and outputs. So they pick the color. We're going to have to take that color, use an output to get it up to the toolbar, use another output from the toolbar up to the easel, and then the easel is going to have to pass that all the way back down to the canvas so that when the user is drawing on the canvas, the right color is selected. It's kind of like playing shoots and ladders with data, right? Like I'm throwing the color up the ladder, and then the color has come back down the chute to get to my easel. So Component Store is going to let us share state across the local component hierarchy without inputs and outputs. Next, let's talk about managing observables. And I'm sorry about this eyeball, but it's the least scary thing anyone drew for observables. So we're just going to have to stare at this eyeball for a few more slides, and then I'll get off of it, I promise. So I have a regular Angular component over here, and I'm subscribing to an HTTP request. And in a normal Angular app, I have to take that subscription, add it to a subscription object on the class, and then an ng on destroy clean up that subscription. With Component Store, we're rarely, if ever, going to call subscribe. We don't have to manage the lifecycle of subscriptions using Component Store. In fact, it's going to handle all of those for us automatically. The next part is decoupling logic. And I think this is a broken chain going snap. Someone kind of works for decoupling responsibilities. But a regular Angular component has to bind data to the template, handle styles, listen for events, manage some local state, and potentially manage some side effects. With Component Store, we're going to shave off state and side effects and isolate them into an Angular service. That way, our components only have a few responsibilities, making them easier to read and potentially a little bit more testable. So this is why we want to use Component Store. Now, let's dive in to some computer code. <laughs> so this is first the state piece. And for state, that's clearly state because that's the state of Alabama, and you know it's Alabama because they wrote Alabama on it. <laughs> okay, so I know what you're thinking once we get into some code. Am I using Comic Sans for my code snippets in addition to the illustrations? Yes, I am. You can download it and use it in your ID as well. You're welcome. So the first thing we need to do is need to set up this state interface. And I'm just going to capture the state that I want to manage inside of this component. So I'm going to have a reference to the canvas element that the user is drawing on, the prompt that they're actually trying to draw a picture for, the color and brush width for their drawing, and then a disabled flag to disable the entire component when we're actually saving the masterpiece. Now that we have our state interface, let's create a component store to manage the state. So to do this, I'm going to create an Angular service. And I'm going to use the injectable decorator on it, but note that I'm not providing this in root. We're going to provide it somewhere else here in a few slides. Instead, note that I'm going to be importing the component store class from NGRX component store. Then I'm going to create a new class that extends component store, providing easel state as the generic type. From there, I'm setting up my initial state object. We don't have a canvas or a prompt yet. We're going to use the first color and the first brush width. And that's the basic setup of component store. From there, we need to expose an API to components to read state from the store and change state from the store as well. So to read state, we can use selectors. So we're going to use this.select coming from the component store parent class to read that brush width. And this is going to return to us an observable of all the times brush width changes as this component exists. Component store also comes with a protected API for patching and setting state. But we don't want to expose those to the components directly. Instead, we're going to create a well-encapsulated API to change state on top of it. So here I have a set brush width method that takes in a brush width and then patches state to send that up. With that done, I can then take the easel store, and I'm going to go ahead and throw it in the providers array of the easel component. And this is doing something really neat. You see, every time we use the easel component, each easel component gets its own instance of easel store. But all the children components of the easel component are sharing the same instance. This is what makes Component Store a local state management library for local hierarchies instead of a global state management solution. From there, it's time to actually use it inside of one of these child components. So I'm going to take the easel store, and I'm going to inject it into my brush width picker component. From there, I can just read the brush width off and bind it to my template using the async pipe, or change the brush width by calling that set brush width method. So what we're doing here is we're bypassing the component hierarchy. 
When the user picks a new width, I'm taking that width, sending it to the easel store, which is going to redirect it to the canvas, allowing me to avoid using inputs and outputs to shoot and ladder all that data around. So Component Store lets us bypass the component hierarchy to reactively share state. Pretty cool, huh? You know, this one bothered me for a while, and I couldn't figure out why until I realized that the thumbnail's on the wrong side of the thumb. <laughs> so I'm sorry for that, too. I didn't draw it. Next, let's talk about effects. And this is how I know that some NGRX users actually did some of this artwork, because when I think of effects, I also want to sit on the ground and, like, put my head in my lap. So, like, I get it, and I wrote effects, so I really understand how this person feels. I'm kidding, of course, effects are super powerful, and in Component Store, they're really powerful, too. So the effect that I want to write is the one that handles the drag and drop behavior on the canvas. To do that, I'm going to write a big effect. Now, just breathe. It's OK. Let's enjoy this picture of a polar bear playing yellow Stratocaster. Breathe for a minute before we get into the code. So to start off with, we're going to use the effect method on the Component Store class to set up our effect. And this is like the most confusing part of Component Store, so I'm going to spend a minute and break this down. Effects work on an observable of function calls to the generated effect function. So what's happening here when we say this.effect and assign it to connect canvas is we're actually creating a function that our components are going to get to call, and that function is called connect canvas. And what you provide to connect canvas is going to come from the generic type that we pass to the observable. So we're saying that inside of this effect, we want to work on an observable of HTML canvas elements. So the generated function is going to expect to receive canvas elements. And every time a component calls connect canvas with a new canvas element, that observable is going to emit that function call. So each call of the effect function pushes the arguments into the effects inner observable. You can see that we're pushing it along this little pathway here. Not too bad. OK, so let's look at the rest of the code. We've got our canvas observable now of all the times this effect gets called with each canvas element. And the reason that we're working on an observable of function calls is so that we can choose our strategy for whether effects run in parallel or not. So like if I was OK with these effects running in parallel, I could choose merge map. If I wanted the effects to run in order but still complete, I could pick concat map. In this case, I want to stop listening to previous event handlers on those canvas elements each time I get a new canvas. So I'm going to use switch map to cancel any running effects. From there, I'm going to store the canvas ref inside of state and get a drawing context. I'm going to set up some observables to listen to the mouse down, mouse move, and mouse up events on that canvas element. And from there, I'm going to set up the logic that actually does the drawing. Now, I think this is a pretty typical RxJS example of like drag and drop, so I'm not going to go too deep into it. But the idea here is that when the user clicks down, we draw a circle. And as the user moves their mouse, we're kind of creating a line to every point where they move the mouse to. When they let go of the mouse, we draw a circle there to create a really smooth line. So with that, the only thing we need to do is actually call connect canvas inside of one of our components. So we're going to take that method and we're going to bring it into the easel canvas component. Here I'm creating my canvas and I'm using view child to get an element ref to it. In ng after view init, I'm going to go ahead and call my effect connect canvas with the native element, which will kick off that effect and will run for the entire lifecycle of the parent component. See, we got this. I think that's sushi. I think that's sushi. And with that, it works. You can drag and drop, and it actually paints. So Component Store lets us reactively build effect streams. And what's really cool about it is it's managing those subscriptions for us. We never call it subscribe, and those subscriptions will get cleaned up when the easel store component gets destroyed. I really do actually genuinely love the way effects work here. I'm happy to not have to handle subscriptions anymore. Last thing to do is wire up some inputs and outputs. I set up one of the easel component to be reusable. And so even though we're not using inputs and outputs internally, I still want to use inputs and outputs for the public API of the easel component. So here I've got my easel component, and I've set up some inputs. So let's take a look at the disabled input. Instead of just like putting it onto a property, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a setter function so that every time a parent component marks the easel as disabled, I'm just going to push that state into the component store. So it's actually really simple to push data from inputs in a component store by using setter functions. But what about outputs? Well, outputs can be a little bit more complicated. Well, they don't have to be, but I've got a pretty cool example of how you can use component store to make outputs really neat. 
So even though component store isn't a component, you can still use event emitters here to share around event emitters in your component hierarchy. So here I have a save event emitter, and the type of that is going to be blob. So that's going to be all the image data from the canvas. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to expose that event emitter as an observable using this listen for save events method. But I want to actually create that blob. And so I'm going to create an effect called on save that the save button is going to actually call when the user clicks on that button. And this effect's a little bit different. As you can see, I'm operating on an observable of void. So this effect doesn't need any arguments here. And what I'm going to do is whenever the user presses save, I'm going to use the exhaust map operator to get the image blob from the canvas. Now, getting image blobs from canvases in the DOM is actually asynchronous. So if the user's sitting there smashing the save button, I don't want to like, do it a bunch of times. I'm OK with the first time they clicked on it, getting that image data, which is why I've chosen exhaust map. Once I've gotten the generated blob, I'm going to emit it to the event emitter. From there, all I need to do is call this on save effect inside of my save button component. Then in the easel component, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up an output called save, and I'm just going to assign it to this.store.listen for save events, allowing me to easily share or connect outputs up. So what are we doing here? Well, when the user hits save, we have this empty event. We're passing it to that on save effect, and the easel store is going to enrich this inside of that effect with the image data, and then pass it to the easel. What's really cool is we've bypassed any output chains, and because we got to use an effect to do it, we also took the asynchronous work out of the components, making our components a little bit easier to read and test. So we can use event emitters inside a component store to share outputs and enrich the data with effects. Last thing to do is to actually use our easel component. So you can see here inside of the template, I'm just using my Firestore service that I've written to get a prompt for the user to draw a picture for. I'm going to disable the component whenever we're actually saving an image back up. And then when they hit that Save button, we're going to take that blob and throw it into Firebase's storage. And now we get to generate some really lovely masterpieces. <laughs> so what have we learned about Component Store? Well, using NGRX Component Store, we can share state across local component hierarchies. This isn't a global state management library. You can use it with, ever, with whatever global state management solution you like. Already using NGX store? Great. Want to use it with NGXS or Akita? Go for it. Not even using an external library? That's fine too. There's places for component store in your application. We can also use it to manage observables. There's that I again. I'm sorry. I had it one more time. And what it's going to do for us is it's going to manage the lifecycle of subscriptions. No more dot subscribe. Instead, we're leaning into the reactivity inside of our components. And finally, we're decoupling logic. So we're moving responsibilities out of our components, making them easier to read and write, and making them a little bit easier to test. So with that, I hope that you find a place of love in your heart for NGRX Component Store. You can learn more at ngx.io to see a full guide on the architecture. As I said, my name is Mike Ryan. You can follow me at Mike Ryan Dev. That's also me. I hope you enjoy your lunch, and I hope you have a great day. Thank you.